let me let me say, I don't know how far I'll get today. We just <clears throat> we'll see how long it goes here inside the family room. But I want you to always know something. Values create values create atmospheres. And culture is determined by the values that a people carry within. When we talk about culture, we're talking about the habitat. We're talking about the, the atmosphere by which something is found. And what we value, what we value as a people, what we value as a church matters. And if we ever stop devaluing something, if we ever stop devaluing something in our church culture, it begins to lose its influence, and, and, and it begins to be replaced. It's not, it, if, we, if we have a value here in this church, it's not that it goes away. It just gets replaced by something else, right? It just gets replaced by, by something else, and that something else begins to fill that space, but has little significance and power. Now, I, I want to, uh, you to understand today, there's a lot of things we value here in this church, but one of the things we value in this church is worship. Our mission statement of this church is to be a family worship center. Worship. Now, when I talk about worship, we could define worship all kinds of different ways, right? We could sit here, I could break down worship, I could talk about that old English word, and I could talk all about that. But today, when I'm talking about worship, I'm talking about our corporate gathering that we have when we come in here together as a church. Okay? I want you to know we have to continue as a church to value worship. It, listen, the power of God moves in worship. Creative things happen in worship. If we just make it about the Word, and listen, I believe that, right? It's, it's a, it, we, we value the Word. It's one of the things we value here. But we have to value our worship. We need to value worship. We need to value our praise. We need to value our time together as a believer, as believers, because worship was not, it's not just be done in private, it's also public. We are called to be a singing people, a worshiping people. Christianity has been known as a singing religion. Supernatural things happen in worship. And I need you guys, I want you guys to understand today. We value that here. We value that here. And if you and I don't watch out, we'll let the enemy steal it right from us. And we'll come in and we'll have religious experience. I don't want religious experiences. I want encounters with the Holy Spirit. Because it's encounters with the Holy Spirit. Hear my heart, man. It's encounters with the Holy Spirit that changes things. In one moment, in one moment in the presence of the Lord. It's what I pray for you all the time. That we would have encounters in this church. That we would have encounters here because one time in the presence of God can change our lives. Just one moment. You can, I can hear me preach a hundred thousand words, but one moment in the presence of God changes everything, man. It changes it all. And we, you, listen, well, I don't know, I, listen, I'm going to go with this. Listen, you can't put responsibility on these people up here only. That's not fair. That's not fair. Now, we have responsibilities as leaders, but it's not fair. And we need to do our part to engage the Lord in our worship. And I know there's all kinds of different people in this room, people that are watching online, that you know what, I say, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I'm conservative and I don't lift my hands and all that. I get that, I understand that. But when does ever lifting hands have to do with anything about your personality? When the Bible says, lift your hands unto the Lord. When the Bible says, sing, why? Well, you know, I'm singing to the Lord. The Bible says, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. But what we do, we become self-conscious instead of God-conscious. And it steals our worship and our engagement with the Holy Spirit. Can I get a good amen here? What am I trying to, we value worship here. And, and worship sets an atmosphere for the power of God to move. It does. And I, I want us to be a worshiping church. 
Because, I listen, God is found in a habitat. Everybody say habitat. You can find God in a habitat. There's a habitat. Now, I understand that God is omnipresent, right? He, listen, we all, we all understand God's here, right? I mean, God's everywhere, right? I mean, it's not like that God comes and goes. He's here. He's omnipresent. But there is something about the manifested presence of the Lord where God shows up in a place when believers are there. That's different than just God being omnipresent. And there's a habitat that God shows up in. One would be faith, one would be unity, and one would be love. God's going to show up in an atmosphere of faith, right? Going to show up in an atmosphere of love, and he's going to show up in an atmosphere of, un of unity. These things are the habitat for the Lord, right? 1 John 4, 8, God is what? Love. Psalm 133, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For there, in unity, the Lord commands the blessing. Listen, if we want to see miracles increase, listen, I'm telling you something, church, we've got to become more of a worshiping church. Now, if I make you mad, I hope I do enough to, that, that, that spurs you. I, I'm not trying to put you on a puppet on a string, but you and I have a responsibility to respond in worship. And it's not about how I feel. It's not. It's not about how I feel. If that's the truth, then there's no faith in that. Did, did you feel like, I'm like this, well, I won't go around the room, but I mean, you might say, I don't feel like, feel like coming today. But you know what? You've done it by faith. Well, if we were walking by our emotions all the time, we would be people that would be severely messed up. I'm the pastor. Someone asked me the other day, so you know what, you ever feel like you're walking in circles? I like, yeah, about once a week I do. <laughs> right? I mean, there's times, man, that I don't want to do something. If I'm going by what I feel, that's going to be confusing to me. I don't walk by my, I walk by faith and not by sight. I, I believe God, right? If I believe God's here, then I worship like he's here. I'm not trying to get God to come. He's here, and I'm responding to him in my worship because of who, he's, who he is. That's what I'm saying is that my, my lifted hands, my shout, my dance, whatever it is, right, that God has called, told me to do, listen, it's because of who he is. It's not whether I feel like or it's the best song or I don't like that song. How, how crazy is that? Well, I really don't like that song. That's the one I really worship to. But I, we all have our favorite songs. But it's not a, when did that church ever become about you? No, that's the problem in America. That's the problem in America, Billy. I'll just preach to me and you. We'll just talk. <laughs> That's the problem in America. We've based our churches on consumerism because it's all about, it's all about making it easy on the people. I'll make it easy on them. Make it easy. I'm, I'm guilty. I'm guilty to make it easy on you. Well, praise the Lord. Ben, this is not going to go good, Bill. See, so just go on up there if you want. And we make it so easy. I've, I've made it easy, and there's no sacrifice anymore. People don't have to make a sacrifice anymore. Don't have to make a choice. I make it easy. Christianity today in America, Western, in, in our culture, we've made Christianity about consumer. What can you do for me? And it was never meant to be that way. Jesus said, if you want to come after me, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Are we, we, are we willing to do that? Because it's in the middle of that that we'll find worship, and we'll find the presence of the Lord. Can I get a good amen? amen. I'm not trying to beat us up, but, I, but I, I felt that it's like the enemy's trying to come in and steal some stuff. And I, I don't want things to be stolen. I'm not going to allow it. I'm a gatekeeper of this church, and I ain't going to allow it. Worship means too much to this church. Our worship together means too much in this church. And I get it. And I hopefully, I may not get there today, but I will get there. I, I'm just going to spend a couple of services on this. There's a lot going on in our world. 
and I understand it. But this is the time you worship is when the things get hard. A mountain climber is not surprised when the mountain gets steep and hard. They actually enjoy the scenery in the place that it's hard. They would expect it to be that way because they're going somewhere. So it's in the middle of our hard times that we don't let the cares of this world and this life hold us down. Right? We can't let that happen. The enemy will steal away a very important piece of your deliverance and what God is going to use to actually cause you to to bring victory to you. Can I get a good amen? So I, I want to talk just a little bit about the experience of worship experiencing worship. Go, go with me today to Second Chronicles chapter 5. And this is the dedication of when they're bringing the, te- uh, this is Solomon's temple was assembled. Remember, it went from tabernacle, right? Went from a tabernacle, it went to, it went to a tent, which we're going to talk about that in a minute. Just a tent. And then it went to a, to a, to a temple. Tabernacle, a tent, to a temple. And it's a Solomon's temple. They built this grand temple to house the presence of the Lord. And they bring in the Ark of the Covenant, which is a representation of the presence of God. The presence of God was with the Ark. In verse 11, And it came to pass, when the priests came out of the most holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping in their division, or what means, no matter if they were on duty or not to be a priest, they all sanctified themselves. When the temple, when, when this thing was completed and they brought the ark into the temple, every single priest sanctified themselves whether they were on duty or not. That's powerful. We could sit there a long time and talk. They took their service to, to God very seriously. Selah. And the Levites, who were the singers, all those of Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Now stop there a second. 120. Isn't there is 120? How many people were in the upper room? 120. When the presence of God, right, came. And it did and came to pass when the trumpet, trumpeters and singers were as what? Pay attention. Were as one and, make one and to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. The house, the house of the Lord. Now, this is Old Testament. This is the Old Testament. Not the New Testament, which Paul said that the New Testament was far better than anything in the Old Testament. This was the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, not the New Covenant where the Spirit of God has been poured out upon all flesh. And man, that the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. I don't know about you, but that's a church service I want to be a part of right there. Right there, I want to be a part of a church service like that. Where the cloud of God, the glory of God fell in a place that people, all of everybody was on the floor. That was Old Covenant. That's Old Testament. But we find some interesting things in this. I, I want you to see. I want. I want you to see where the the presence of God manifested, this divine visitation. What happened? And I, just real quick, I'm just going to go through this. It just uh, these were the precursors. They, the people assembled as one. 
There was unity. There was unity. I said it a little while ago. Worship was never to be done in private alone or it was just, 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 just a private place. It is private, but a public expression of it. I want, I want you to hear what I'm saying this morning, church. Get, listen, if we, if we want to have a habitat for God and to experience God in worship, one of the things we got to have is unity, period. If there's no unity, God's not going to be there. Where there's envy, strife, division, there's confusion and every evil work. That's why we always have to guard unity. Unity is not uniformity. It's not all of us being the same. Unity is where you and I are focused. What, what, is, what is it we do? We put these words on the screen. It's not because we're having some karaoke day. We're trying to bring everybody into unity. And listen, this is the power of this. When we feel as a church, can I, can I preach, help you out, pastor you a little bit? The more we are connected as a body, the more the unity will be and the greater the presence of the Lord will be when we're together. The less connected you are to a church, the less connected we are to one. This is what the enemy's trying to do. He's getting us all so busy that we have no time to connect with one another. I'm not getting on anybody. I'm I'm not getting on anybody. Please please don't, please hear my heart today. I I am not the guy that has the hammer. But sometimes I do have to come with a hammer. Because the Bible says the word is a hammer. But listen, we get challenged with this every week. That's why you and I, listen, you need to value. I need to value. We need to value one another. And listen, I'm I'm just being honest with this. I'm just talking about increasing presence in the house. It just takes, listen, you're not just, when you come in here before service, I know you come in here, some of you on two wheels. I get it. But it's, it's like, can I be hard? How much do we value the presence of the Lord? Because I'll guarantee you one thing. Can I help you? If you're on your travel volleyball team, travel baseball team, I'm not against any of that. I guarantee you to be 30 minutes early. But you can't even get up out of the bed on a Sunday morning. Well, to make it into the presence, to make it into a place in assembly. Why are you saying this? I'm saying because the more we feel connected to one another, it's relational. It's relational. And the thing is, church, is that, is, is that listen, it, it, and you just don't, just, just don't come and just sit down. Get up out of your seat and go, hey, how you doing? Right? How are you doing? How are you doing? Because the more we feel connected, we're one. It increases presence. Why? Because we feel we can't be dismembered. There's got to be body language. Let me help you. There's got to be body language. We're all members of the body, and there has to be body language. And, there, and, and, and we come together as a church. There, there needs to be expression. And it starts by us being unified. Jesus said it like this, I desire mercy. He said, he said, go read this and find out what this means. I desire mercy more than sacrifice. I desire compassion more than sacrifice. And we all know that worship is a sacrifice at times. But you can come in here with a sacrifice of praise, and if we don't have compassion, listen, that worship we're doing means absolutely nothing. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you bring your gift to the altar and you find that you have odd against someone, he said, leave your gift at the altar, go reconcile to your brother, and then come back and offer, the, offer, offer your gift at the altar. There's some things we do for God that are gifts that means absolutely nothing unless we are connected with somebody. So the enemy's trying to get us dismembered because he knows a body that's dismembered will be a body that has no body language. If you're brand new to this church, check it out now. Hey, listen, there's a place for you here. Get involved. Get connected. 
So a habitat for God. They were, with, they were one. They were together. They were in unity. They were there together, publicly assembling, right? They were there. You love. There's got to be love in a church. And we got that here. We got unity here. I'm not doing anything we don't, I'm just trying to increase things. It takes faith for us to respond to God in faith. So important, right? And they respond. And I want you to see this. Go back to verse 13. It says they began to go and praise and sing. And the last part of this thing, if you could put it up there, it says for he, they were singing this. This is their song. Ready? You ready? This was their song. This is what they were saying and praising. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. That's a loaded statement. It's, it's loaded. What, what do you mean the Lord is good? For he is good. That's his character. I'm going to respond to God out of his character. He's good. My day's bad. Doesn't matter. He's still good. Well, I'm worried. No, no worry in heaven. He's good. I'm going through a bad time. Pastor Paul, I'm going through a struggle. I understand. But he's still good. And I'm going to respond in my worship because he's good. Why am I worshiping God this morning? You know why? Because he's good. It's just for his good and his mercy, his hesed, H-E-S-E-D, it's, uh, it's a word that means loyal love, covenant love. That's what the word means. Mercy, you see the word mercy or you hear uh, loving kindness. You can look up the word, it's, it's amazing. It means loyal love, covenant love. Coven it's God's covenant to us. For he's good. So I'm, I'm worshiping his character, and I'm worshiping him for who he is. He's in covenant with me. God's going to take care of me. I don't know how it's all going to turn out. Listen, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, he's good, and I know he's going to work all things together for my good, and I'm going to lift my hands. I'm going to respond to God because that's what he's called me to do. Just maybe when we would get outside of ourselves and respond to the Lord, something different may shift in our lives. But see, what happens is we make it about our feelings and not faith. And the Bible says in Psalm 22, verse 3, God inhabits the praises of his people. God sets down in the midst. You want to get God involved in your life? Start worshiping, praising him. You guys all right? Worship, look, look this, is my, this is what I had. To, you can put it up there. Worship is my response to who God is and what he has done. That's what it is. That's what worship is. It's my response to who God is and what he's done. All right? So when I come into our, when we come in here to get together as a church, you know what I'm doing? I'm saying, God, I'm going to worship you for who you are and what you've done. So I don't know what God's done. Open up this book. And if you don't have a testimony... There's a whole book full of testimony right here. Listen, maybe that's what we need to do. When we can't see, we don't understand, maybe I need to open up my Bible and find me a testimony of the goodness of God and start praising God from right there. Right? That's what worship is. It, it's, 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 uh, worship is, 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 is my response to what God, who God is and what he has done. But revelation always precedes worship. You and I will not worship if we have no revelation. Let me help you now. God is always around us, wanting to encounter us. And our corporate expression is fueled by a personal revelation of who God is. My personal revelation is echoed in the corporate expression. If we have, a, I put this down, if we have a whole room full of Christians, the omnipresence of God is here. But if there's no personal revelation of who God is and what he's done, you can forget about him manifesting in power in that room. I need you to understand this. You can have a whole room full of people but if there's no personal revelation of who God is, it w listen here, there will be no, there will be no power being released in that room at all. 
None. I don't want to be a church that's dead. I don't want to be a church that has no power in it. I don't. Now, we do have that here. I'm thankful for that. We value that. It's a culture. It's a habitat. When God, when people come in, they need to find that from us. Our personal revelation brings a response. Let me give you a for instance. Jesus, he's in a room. The Bible says there were so many people in the room, there was no more room. There were so many people there, it was packed out in this room. The Bible says this in Luke's gospel. It says the power, so there was these Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious people were all around Jesus, and the Bible says the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So that tells me there were sick people in the house, there was people that needed Jesus' touch, and they were all around him, the power, but they did not believe. It says the power of the Lord was present to heal them. But there was only one guy. All of a sudden, Jesus is teaching him, the power of the Lord is present to heal them. And all of a sudden, he starts feeling stuff, toweling or whatever, starts falling on his head. And he's like, what's going on? You know. And they lower a man down into the presence of Jesus, and he gets healed and walks out in the presence of everybody else where the power of the Lord was present to heal them. But if there's no faith, if there's no faith, if there's no response to who he is, revelation produces a response. You guys all right here? You're understanding this. Faith is the conductor of the power of God. The Bible says this about Jesus. Jesus couldn't do very many mighty works in his own hometown because of their unbelief. Could you imagine the son of the living God Said he went back to his hometown. He went back to the hometown and couldn't do a thing because they couldn't see past that it was just Joseph's son, Joseph and Mary's son. And it was because of their unbelief. It dowed down the power of God. The power of God could not move. You could have a room full of Christians. Right? But if we have no revelation of who he is, there'll be no power in that room. Zero. Is the, is the presence of the Lord here? Is the power of the Lord present to heal? What's the determining factor? The people that are engaging it. So when we start making the worship about a song, right, we've missed it. You, we're off left field somewhere. Because it's not about the song. Matter of fact, that's immaturity. It is. Now, I'm not saying there's not anointing on songs. There is. But my revelation is determining everything in my response. If I can't see him, I won't respond. If I can't see him, I won't respond in worship. We take the first 30 minutes of our services every single week, sometimes 40. We had somebody come not too long ago and said, man, you guys, you mean you guys stand for 45 minutes singing. I haven't saw that guy back, so I mean, praise the Lord, so he must not like that too well. It doesn't matter to me. I like to be an hour and 45 minutes. This is the type of people that God's wanting right now. Not people that's just consumers in Christianity, but people are re really after the presence of God, right? And if that's 30 minutes, 30 minutes. If that's 45 minutes, 45 minutes. If it's an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes. If it's an hour and a half, it's an hour and a half. I know we all come from different backgrounds. And I understand that. But our services are geared for you to encounter God. Right? So if we want to skip the singing for the sermon, there's probably an issue. If we find ourselves bored in the middle of worship service, probably an issue. If we find ourselves not participating, there's an issue. Well, praise the Lord. Hope you guys were encouraged today. <laughs> Hope you come back next week. We'll have a few, hopefully.
I, I, I'm just trying to help us. I'm not trying to get on anybody. I'm not trying to, listen, I'm talking about all of us. I, I want to see, this is a, we value this in our church, right? I mean, this church has always, you know, one of the things about this church is we've always, um, you, you know, when, when Pastor Jim and Kathy started this church, we, it was different. We've always been different. Now, today, everybody caught up to what we've been doing for a long time. Because at that time, we were the only ones singing off the wall. Right? Right, Tam? Huh? Tammy up here, flipping those overhead, those over, those overhead projectors. She pulled those things off and slapped those things on. She was just, I mean, it was, it was the Lord. I mean, that was all just core. It was just awesome. Putting those things up there. Singing those songs. I can remember the movement, remember the, the, how we've progressed, right? Just how, how things moved along. But we, we, we've always been different. Because we've always, the one thing that when this church began, I can remember Pastor Jim telling me, he said, I want people to encounter God. That's what we want. Now, there's sometimes a worship only goes ankle deep. It's the way it goes. Sometimes that's the way it is. It's just ankle-deep worship, and that's okay because the Lord may be doing something else. But sometimes it's at knee-deep. Sometimes it's waist-deep. Sometimes it's waters to swim in, right? Sometimes, man, the worship team, I mean, I'm thankful for our worship team. How about you? But you know what? I mean, yeah, it, it should be. It should be. But you know what? As much as they're human too, right? And they, they don't always hit it right, and I'm sure that, that not everybody is always on, on, on the right step. I don't ever really notice. I mean, but, you know, I'm sure everybody's not always on step or on the right chord or the right thing. And, or, or sometimes they just may miss it up here totally. We may be, get out of the river and we didn't get back in it for whatever reason. I understand all that. Things like that happen. But we have a responsibility to engage and respond. And it comes from our revelation. If you're not singing, it's because you're not seeing. If you hear anything, that's the thing I want you to leave out here with today. If you're not singing and you're not responding, it's because we're not seeing yet. Because you see before you ever sing. You see before you ever sing. Go with me real quick here. I'll, I'll lay this out, and then we'll, we'll land the plane at some point. First, go to First Chronicles. Can I get a good amen here? Amen. All right. I'm talking about worship. I'm talking about our singing, our worship together, valuing our time together, connection, unity, love, faith. These are important things that we need. Value our time together as a church. And I know you do, but I want to encourage you. I'm, I'm a coach today, right? I'm always coached. But value this time. I have some. I mean, won't we as a church, and we're, we're doing this, I'm just encouraging this, won't we, man, really truly start preparing our hearts on Sunday morning before we ever get here? Because if we come in worshiping, listen, you don't take two songs to get the motor running. I mean, that's a lot of time. You heard me say that. It's a lot of time it's like that, you know, it's like that person that's pulling them. Poof, 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 poof. Choke it up. <laughs> and found out the second song. <laughs> but the second song, it hit. But if I come in with my heart prepared, if I come in, listen, I'm not, God's not asking you to go to a, to, to, you know, to, if, if he does, it's great, but you know, to, to go off to some cave somewhere. To, but I'm just talking about turning your mind's attention, heart's affection towards the Lord just a while before you get here. I'll guarantee it'll stimulate. That's why I told the worship team, listen, they've been singing for the last 30 minutes, singing about the Lord, even though they're actually practicing. They've been singing for 30 minutes. Even in the practice, they're still singing to the Lord. They're praying. And all of a sudden, you got a lot of people start coming into the church. I just told Barry this the other day. you, you got a lot of people coming to the church. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of loads on people's backs, right? And you guys are up here, and everybody else is down here, and we have to understand that. Their job on this platform is there's a bunch of paralytics that are laying on mats. And our job as a church, their job and, and, and my job is to get people to Jesus. 
But it's also your job to get people to Jesus because your worship and the person beside you could be affected because you're lifting your hands, because you shout. I saw it happen in this church so many times when someone would just shout unto God and all of a sudden things would start breaking off of people. Listen, I'm telling you, man, we have a responsibility to get people to Jesus. Now, so let's look at this. First Chronicles. You can see this. First Chronicles chapter 15. Now, check this out. I'm going to teach you something real quick. So God told Moses to build a tabernacle. Remember that? This beautiful tabernacle, all this furnishings inside this tabernacle. It's a beautiful thing, right? I mean, they got all these different utensils, and they got the bronze laver out there outside. They got the, the, the altar, you know, the, 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 the sacrificial altar, the, uh, the, the brazen altar, the, the bronze laver that held the water. They washed their hands. They'd walk inside this, this tabernacle, and there was, you know, there was a table with this bread on it. And there was this, this, this lampstand. It had this, it was beautiful menorah that would lit, it lit the inside of this tabernacle, and it had the altar of incense. It had this beautiful, beautiful, thick uh, uh, curtain that separated the ark. We could talk about all this stuff. God told him to build it this way. And he put that ark behind that, behind that curtain. And nobody could see it. Nobody. Except for one guy. The high priest. And he would go in there one time a year. The only time. Now, they could see it from the outside because the glory of God, there was a cloud that was all the way, all the time over that tabernacle. But no one saw that ark. There was one guy that could get close, nobody else. And that was one time a year. Now, in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, the ark had been taken captive by the Philistines, right? Remember this story real quick? Uh, the ark goes into the camp. They put it in their temple called Dagon's Temple. And they went in there three different times, and Dagon's head and was, I think it was his head and his arms, maybe. Was that what it was, Stephen? Was, was, was falling on the ground. They, they, you know, they took some, you know, some, some Gorilla Glue, put it back together, you know. They go in there again, and it's off again. They Gorilla Glue it again, again, and they come in, and it's off again. Right? And they said, listen, we got to get this guy, we got to get this thing out of here. So they send the ark away. But it was causing a lot of problems. David hears about it, 80 years, 80 years in captivity. He says, listen, I'm going back to get the ark. I'm going to go back and get this ark. Hadn't been in a tabernacle for 80 years. Been in captivity to the Philistines. And David does something interesting. He makes a tent. A tent. Not a tabernacle. A tent. But really, if you start looking, it was a merchant's tent. Just something like a pop-up, like a, like a pop-up. That's what it, he made. He made a pop-up. We're going to put it down here to our terms. It was a pop-up. And he puts a pop-up, and he puts the ark in the pop-up. And God's okay with it. Check this out in verse 1 through 3. Then David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a what? A tent for it. And David said, no one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, but the Lord had chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. And David gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. Chapter 16, verse 1. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle, or the actual word here is tent, that David had erected for it. And they offered burnt offerings, peace offerings before God. David makes a tent. It's interesting to me. The tent has no partitions, and everyone that ministered to the Lord had access to it. It just wasn't one guy. It was the whole priesthood. Matter of fact, people could walk down the street, and they saw people worship it. They saw the ark. The thing that was before, they could not even access it. One guy, no one could ever see the ark. They saw the presence of God in a cloud, but now they're actually sent. David makes a tent. God's okay with it. Everybody now, all the priests had opportunity to minister before the Lord. Everybody did. This is interesting to me. 
The tabernacle of David or the tent of David had no instructions on how to be built. Moses' tabernacle was ordered to be built a certain way. There was inclus- inclusivity. It wasn't limited to high priests. It was, it was all the priests had access to it. Everybody could actually gather around and see it. There was a guy named Obed-Edom. And Obed-Edom was when David went and took the ark originally from the Philistines. They sent it back. David went and got it. All of a sudden, David said, Let's, we're going to get it back to the—and the, they put it on an ox cart. Remember this story? They put it on an ox cart. It was supposed to be bored by the Levites on the back side, but he puts it on a cart. And the Bible says he comes to the place, and it said that the cart actually uh, began to hit a pothole, whatever it was, right in West Virginia. We're, we're all used to that, praise the Lord. It's funny. You know, we're going to Taste Valley. You know, right there underneath the, the 35, inter, you know. I mean, it's like Haiti right there. No, I'm being serious. Like, like I'm talking about one person's going way over here. The other person, there's no cars coming. I mean, like, everybody just keeps going to praise the Lord. Unreal. And all of a sudden, this cart hits a hole, and the Bible says the ark rocked. And there was a a guy by the name, what was his name, Steve? Yuza. Stuck out his hand and touched the ark, and he died. So, full stop, right? What's going on here? They take the thing and take it over to Obed-Edom's house, put it, put it over in his house. Hey, you keep it there. All right, we're going to go figure this out. The Bible says that David went and started reading the book, found out how it was supposed to be done, and they went back, and that's how they brought it back here. But it's in Obed-Edom's house, and Obed-Edom is a Gittite. He's not, even a, he's, not even an, he's not even an Israelite. And the ark is in his house, and the Bible says his house is blessed because of the ark. Check this out. This is, is, the Bible's fun. It's fascinating. They come and get it. Hey, listen, thanks, thanks a lot for keeping that for us. That doesn't belong to you. It belongs to us. So we're getting this out. They could put on the, and guess what? They, they went out of the house, and guess where we find over here in Chronicles? We find a guy by Obed-Edom, the same dude. Listen, you know what he done? He followed that ark. He became a gatekeeper in, 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 in David's tent. Wouldn't you? Wherever you're going, I'm going with you. Right? So David makes this tent that everybody has access to. And there's 24-7 worship and praise going on. You can read it. That's going on. People. Are, David starts paying the people, paying the priests, to actually be the worshipers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to do one thing, to worship and praise God. That's it. Expressively, Theologians believe that many of the Psalms was penned around David's tent. They were so encountered the presence of the Lord, it started to change them. Now, let me sew this up for today. In Amos chapter 9, this is the prophet Amos, minor prophet, major message, right? Minor prophet, major message. And Amos writes this. He talks about a day in the future prophetically. Now remember now, it was in a tabernacle, partitioned off, David's tent made, no, no partitions. It, there was no, it was inclusive. It was, no exclu- it was not exclusive, it was inclusive. There was expression that was going on. All this was happening around David's tent. It lasted for a while, and then all of a sudden they go and put it in the temp- temple. I believe it was God's plan. He was fulfilling. He was making, he had already told David, he said, you know, you're going to build this thing. I don't think it was ever God's plan. He never wanted to be in a tent anyway. <laughs> 250 years after this tabernacle of David had been erected, Amos prophesied about a day that would come when this tabernacle would be rebuilt. Check it out. On that day, I will raise up the what? Not the tabernacle of Moses. Not Solomon's temple. He said, I'm going to rebuild something. I'm going to raise up or rebuild the tabernacle of David on that day. Which has fallen down 
and repair its damages, and I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Verse 12, that they may possess. I could sit there and preach for days. Worship is a way that we possess land. It's as evangelism attached to it. The Edomites are the, are the, are the, uh, 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 are, are the ancestors or the, uh, the descendants of Esau. Esau is the one that sold his birthright. We have all kinds of people today that sold their birthright, their inheritance, and they're working for the enemy. But the worship, the restored tabernacle of David will restore back people to their destiny and who they're called to be. They may possess the remnant of Eden and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing? Who does what? Rebuilds the tabernacle of David. God was going to use the restored tabernacle of David to get the job done. Israel was living in apathy. They were living in spiritual apathy, idolatry. It was the climate of the day, and they were in rebellion to God. And God begins to prophesy about a day that God was going to restore worship and restore a tabernacle. And there would be a people that would step into destiny because you and I are called to worship. Now, find your Bible, this scripture right here, and we'll land this plane. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Look what this says right here. Barnabas and Paul had been sent out on the missionary journey. Gentiles were getting saved. Revival was going on. Right? There was always this tiff in the early church. You've got to remember this now. This was one of the reasons that uh, with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., was God was actually putting a, an end to temple worship and the, and the Mosaic economy. Because when Jesus died, it wasn't just like all of a sudden, boom, everybody started doing the right thing. We find it in Galatia, in, the, in in the book of Galatians. He was getting on the Judaizers, people that were saved. They were trying to bring people back underneath the law. So one of the reasons that God had to destroy, the, it was the judgment of God in 70 AD when, he tore the temp, when, when the temple was destroyed by Titus. It was the reason why is because he had to get rid of the opportunity to even go back to that stuff because temple worship was still going on, sacrifice was still going on, people were trying to be brought back underneath the law, so all of a sudden, boom, it's ended. The temple was destroyed. Jesus prophesied about it in Matthew 24. 30 years, exactly 30, or 30 years, 40 years, I'm sorry, 40 years. From the time that Jesus said, I'm going to tear this temple down, 40 years later, it happened. Jesus prophesied about this temple being destroyed. You read Matthew 24, it's all that. So, Barnabas and Saul, or Barnabas and Paul, they've had missionary journeys. The, 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 the church, the church of Jerusalem, James is the pastor, the main church, right? This is the hub. They're questioning, they're wondering. And there was questions. So Paul and Barnabas came back with some questions to James and said, hey, listen, there, there are some things. There's people trying to bring us back under the law. They're saying, hey, man, you know, you can't, you know, you can't eat things uh, with blood, blah, blah, blah. There's all kinds of questions. So they're hearing them out. Paul, Paul and Barnabas are telling about the miracles, signs, wonders, people getting saved, people getting born again. They start having the problems, and James stands up and starts talking to them about what they're going to do and how they're going to handle these things. And then verse 15, I want you to see this. Actually, verse 6. Well, it's verse 15. And with this, so when he heard all this, what was going on, and with this, the words of the prophets agree just as this is written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up so the rest of mankind may seek the Lord even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. James is hearing this, the pastor at Jerusalem. He hears all this. You know what he says? Oh, 
Oh, we've heard this before. This is what Amos prophesied about, that God would rebuild a tabernacle, a tent, and, and, and it, would, it would be rebuilt. It wouldn't be rebuilt with, a, with structure and, and two-by-fours and, and canvas. He said, no, I'm going to rebuild, and I'm going to make a tabernacle, and this tabernacle would become a people, a people, not just Jew, but also Gentiles. All of humanity now becomes a tabernacle, a, 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 the tabernacle of David, where we have unhindered worship 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's no exclusivity. It's inclusive. Everybody in this room has access to the presence of the Lord. Everybody, whether you listen, it doesn't matter. You have access to the presence of Almighty God. Hallelujah. It's expressive. This worship is to be expressive. We're never to be just like this with us not in the law worshiping our king and we ought to be expressive the bible they would sing they around david tabernacle they would shout and they would play instruments Amen. worship that is inclusive worship that is expressive what's that last one put that other one expressive it's expressive it's it's impressive It impresses us. It makes impression on us. I know I've said a lot today, but I want you to understand. God said he was going to rebuild the tabernacle of David, and he has. It's called the new covenant. I don't have to go. Listen, you don't need me to get to the presence of the Lord. You don't need me to pray. You don't come to me for me to pray to God for you. I will do that for you. We can come into agreement. But you can go to the Father because of your high priest, Jesus Christ. You have an advocate with the Father. You and I can step in to the presence of the Lord. Listen, what's, what's going on here on a Sunday morning is the tabernacle of David. Man, open your ears up to hear. Do you understand that when we worship God speaking? Do you understand that when we're worshiping together that angels are moving in this place? Do you understand stuff is going on around us all the time? All I need to do is just engage. Don't let the enemy talk you out of your worship. Oh, I don't know. I, that's not my personality. Well, hold on a second. The same people that say that, now I'm not, listen, I'm not asking for you to do cartwheels, okay? That's not what I'm saying. If the Lord tells you to do cartwheels, go do a cartwheel. I'm not, no, no, I'm just talking about expressing yourself. Well, I don't, I don't, I'm just not that way. I don't really express myself. Time out. It's this is the same people that say that, that yell from a guy throwing a 60-yard piece of pig skin going, I mean, rip their shirts, paint them and everything else. And you thought that was crazy? Or you thought this stuff in here was crazy? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm just not, that. no, hold on a second, hold on. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the what? There's always expression from our hearts. I'm not trying to make anybody do anything. That's not my point. I do not want you a, a puppet on the string. But I'm just saying to you, quit hiding behind the excuses and start engaging in worship because there's something. Number one, he's worthy of it. But I'll guarantee when you do it and you start engaging it, it will make impression on your life. Well, I'm going through a dark time. That's the, probably the time you need to scream and shout the loudest. When things are going good, it's in that moment. You probably need to lift your hand. It's probably in that moment that you dance. It's probably in that moment when it's the darkest time. Right? Therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise unto God, which is the fruit of our lips, giving praise unto his name. It's a sacrifice to praise. Church, listen, I'm done. It's the one thing you, this is the one thing you will not be able to offer into eternity. In heaven, you will never be able to offer the sacrifice of praise. You'll never offer it. You'll never get to offer it. It won't be a sacrifice anymore. It's the, this is the only place that you and I will actually offer the sacrifice of praise unto God. In the midst of our struggle, I'll just worship you. I don't understand it, but God, I'm going to lift my hands. I don't get it right now, God. Everything seems maybe going off the left field. God, this is not what you've promised. I, I believe I've heard you, blah, 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 right? The stuff we say. Well, what am I going to do? I'm just going to worship him. Trust, trust, 
trust, right? Trust in God. Can I get a good amen, amen. here? Are you guys understanding what I'm saying? God said, I'm going to rebuild something. I'm not going to rebuild Moses' tabernacle. I'm going to rebuild this tabernacle called the Tabernacle of David. The thing that David put up on a, right? Put, popped up, put a pop up. And God was okay with it. And all of a sudden, boom, here it comes. Here it comes, right? They gathered around that thing. They were expressive. It, was in, it, it, wasn't, in, it wasn't exclusive anymore. That thing was, God's presence could be seen. You could walk down the road. Well, there's those crazy Pentecostals over there. Right? There's those crazy, there's those crazy Israelites But it was making impression on them. And it makes impression on us. I know I've heard you've heard me tell the story so many times, but I just sat right back there, right in front of Kelly. Those two seats right there. That's when I came into this church. That's the place I sat. Right there. Back in 1997. That's the place right there. And I can remember, I know you've heard me say it so many times. I know that. But I've sat right here. Never forget it. This is the place I would sit. You understand, I'm not a transplant, right? I'm a son of this house. But I can remember me standing here in worship, right? And I can remember the time when I went to right here. That was a huge step for me, right? And I can remember me swaying a little bit, right? You ever watch this? I, I watch service when I'm not here. It's, you know, if, if I'm not here, I watch services. There's one thing about you guys. You guys are great swayers. Now, if you could just add a. But I can remember the time when I was like that. And I can remember the time when I went like that. I can remember the time I danced for the first time. I can remember the time when I shout. What am I saying? Listen, this is why it's important for me to do this. I need to teach you. I've got to teach you. And I know most of you probably do this, or maybe you don't. Maybe, you've been, maybe things have been stolen from you. But at the end of the day, we need to engage. And it may get you out of your box. And that's all right. You've got to stop being self-conscious. Because when you get self-conscious, you lose God consciousness. And it's all about God. And when I lose God's conscience, my worship leaves out the window with it. You guys all right? I don't care where you're at. If it's right here, praise the Lord. If it's like this, praise the Lord. If it's a dance, praise the Lord. If it means taking a lap. I remember the first time I ever ran. I took a lap. I remember taking lap, laps in this church some dark, dark times in my life with tears running down my face. I certainly didn't feel like it. But I ran because God told me to. So I need you to run in your freedom. Remember like it's yesterday. My king's worthy of worship. Amen? You guys all right? I want you to experience worship. Hallelujah. I want you to stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Don't you love Jesus? Come on. Revelation. Seeing before singing. I got to see him. I got to see who he is. And when I see who he is, that's what the enemy tries to do. He comes and tries to fog up your vision. That way you don't see him. Because when I don't see him, I won't worship. In Revelation chapter 4, it talks all about it. There's these, there's these uh, uh, interesting creatures. I don't want to understand it. These interesting creatures, have they I had eyes all around. They, they go around the, the, the presence of the Lord or the, or the throne of God. They all, they just rotate. It, says, it specifically says there's eyes. They have eyes all around them. I believe it's interesting because I believe no matter what, where they go, if they went 
if they go one, uh, one click this way or one click that way, they see something different about God. And the Bible says these creatures day and night sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's because they're seeing a new side of God. Because, see, their singing is fueled by their sin. The more I see him, the more I'm going to sing. The more I'm going to worship. You guys all right? You got that? What's Jesus done for you? Let me ask you, what's Jesus done for you? Come on, what's he done for you? What have you let the enemy steal? What have you let, what have you let him, what, what, what kind of fog has come in, in your eyes, in your vision that you can't see it? Maybe it's busyness. Maybe it's no longer just being able to see God. You're just so busy. Maybe it's, maybe it's some sin that, that you need to deal with, some unrepentant sin that needs to be dealt with in your life, and you know it. Get rid of it, man. Get, start seeing him good. Start seeing him clearly again. Maybe it's unforgiveness in your heart, or, 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 or maybe it's just you're not just paying attention about God at all right now, and you need to. Just see Him. Turn your mind's attention, heart's affection towards the Lord, and I'll guarantee you it'll fuel worship. And not just in here, it will fuel worship out there. We're the tabernacle of David. The presence of God is always here. The church is the tabernacle of David. Fueled, fueled by the presence of the Lord. What's it going to be like in heaven, church? What's it going to be like? It's going to be, Jesus said, pray it like this, on earth as it what? On earth as it is in heaven. What's going on in heaven? Oh, there's praise. So guess what? Let's just practice now for what we're going to be doing for eternity. Amen? You love the Lord today. Hallelujah. Won't you lift your hands to the King today? Father, thank you. We lift one hand without wrath, one hand without doubting today, God. Today, Father, I lift my hands in surrender to you. And Lord, today I pray. I pray, Lord God, that we would be a people, Lord God, that praise, that we are worshipers, God. We are the tabernacle of David. Hallelujah. Lord, you're rebuilding this. You're, you're re-energizing, reigniting, Lord God, worship, Lord, for us as a congregation, that you're reigniting us, Lord God, as, as a people of worship all the time, God, that we will, Lord God, worship you, praise you. And I get it, God. There's many ways I can worship you. My life is worship. My lifestyle's worship, but God, I know there's something special when we come together as a church, as a body of people to sing together, to praise together. Something happens, God. The presence of God increases, and Lord, miracles and signs and wonders are in your presence, God. So Lord, if the floodwaters are increasing, it's just, it's just logical that we'd be swept up in it, God, that we'd be swept up in it, Father. So God, I pray today that you would give us a revelation of this and that you would open our eyes to see open our eyes to see your truth open our eyes to see who you are that Lord God this scene will produce a singing a singing people a hope filled people a people Lord God filled with your presence we thank you God for what you're doing in Jesus mighty glorious name. In Jesus' mighty and glorious name. Hallelujah. Won't you just pray out to the Lord real